Well, good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be interviewing Cyril De Maria, who is uh, executive director of UBS, um, with six books and enormous amount of uh, academic background. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about yourself and then also about what you spoke at the conference this morning. Of course, yeah, sure. Um, I have 15 years of experience. Um, I started in venture capital and then uh, became independent for a while. Uh, over the last eight years, for example, I've been advising family offices and pension funds, uh, which were investing in uh, either direct investment, co-investment or fund investment. Before you joined the evil forces. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say it like this. <laughs> no, uh, I'm only but, joking. Uh, uh, but I joined the bank, yeah, to do research and uh, notably to work on private markets, which means private equity, private debt and real assets. And my job is to help clients, just mm -hmm. like the family offices or ultra high net worth to invest in uh, these asset classes. So um, in your um, uh, analysis, you have done quite a lot of work on the impact of the fees uh, yep. management fees mm -hmm. um, on the actual performance uh, of True. the fund. Yep. So maybe you could give uh, give me a little summary uh, of, of what you talked about at length this mo this afternoon. With pleasure. Um, yeah, the study was undertaken at my uh, university, which is mm -hmm. University of St. Gallen. And uh, what I did basically was to look with the help of a private bank in, in Geneva, which sponsored it, um, which is Crédit Agricole, was to look for them into three different topics. What what do investors want when they invest in private you equity? You talk about LPs? Yeah. Uh -huh. Then what do they really get? And that's what I presented today. Okay. And then if they don't get exactly what they want, what could they do? And that was the third part. And that's the topic uh -huh. of the sixth book. So just coming back to your question, uh, basically uh, what I discovered is that actually there is a gap, obviously, between gross returns and net returns. Mm -hmm. So my first job was to look at gross returns and rebuild them because we don't have this kind of statistics. Mm -hmm. And the second part was to try to analyze what's the difference between these gross and net returns and do they break or make a performance compared to the public market equivalent. And interestingly enough, actually we discovered, I discovered, sorry, that uh, I said we because my sponsor was part of it, um, <laughs> that um, it doesn't make or break the performance. There is obviously a gap and that might be something that the investors want to work for, mm -hmm. on, but it doesn't necessarily hurt them the way they think. That's the first finding. The second finding, which is a, le a little bit uh, different from mm -hmm. what we would expect from the industry is that the carried interest uh, also doesn't play a big role in that it captures part of the performance but it doesn't necessarily create a hole in it if you want so it's good because it means in terms of alignment of interest it's pretty effective the third finding that you might find interesting is that we talk a lot about the hurdle rate as a way to align interest right this preferred return the 8%. rate the percent yes exactly yeah, okay and actually what i discovered is that it might actually hurt because if the fund manager performs in a downward micro environment mm -hmm. he might perform below the 8% but above the public market equivalent and then he gets sanctioned because he doesn't achieve the he minimum. He should be rewarded. Exactly. But, and that's the other side, if the market performs at 8% somehow and if it just replicates the market it gets a performance fee but why? I mean it should be above that, right? So we should think about a different mechanism and maybe build something which is on a relative scale compared maybe to the public market equivalent. So it would ratchet up or down exactly. depending on the market and movement. And then the alignment of interest would improve. Because the 8% I know as a fact it sort of was picked up from the air uh, in the olden days by... That's by the impression exactly, that it gives. Exactly. <laughs> it has no real, real scientific or academic background. True. Okay. Um, you also uh, did a roundtable today, which was very uh, interesting on co-investment because co-investment again is one of those really True. wonderful, uh, you know, terminologies that everybody uses mm -hmm. and everybody wants more yeah. of. Yeah. So maybe you could again summarize that for yeah. us. Actually, it was from the bank's clients, uh, family offices, and ultra high net worth. We had many questions about. Yeah, but how do we handle investing directly? Uh -huh. Co-investing is it the same thing? Um, how does it position versus the funds? And so we started to, to answer this kind of question in two different ways. The first one is that co-investment is actually something different. It's not better, it's not worse, it's just different. And cost saving is part of the reasoning, but you should never neglect the risk 
which goes with co-investment. What sort of risks? For example, um, all the risks that the fund <coughs> should shield you from. For example, uh, liabilities, if there is something going wrong with an investment. Of course, might be also some reputational damage. If something wrong happens in the underlying company, you're not responsible, so you're just a fund investor. And all the other elements attached to being part of the governance of a company. So, so sitting you're not at a shielding board, yourself exactly. from all yeah. those... Uh... So it either involves more work from you, and so more resource consumption, mm -hmm. or more risk if you leave this unmanaged. The second aspect is, of course, that you might find it interesting still, co-investments, if you want to change your exposure and fine-tuning it. For example, if you're sitting here in Dubai and you say, I want to have more location in Europe, but I don't necessarily want to go through funds because they don't exactly serve what I need, uh -huh. then you might say, okay, how about I team up with a, a, a general partner, a fund manager, and then we decide that I would have the right to co-invest if I really want to get exposure, for example, in retail, because mm -hmm. I might want these industries to come back to my home country and I might actually help them to settle down in the Emirates, which the makes invest. a lot yeah, of sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, th this whole notion that people are so uh, concerned by co-investment because they save that that management fee, you're saying is 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 needs to be relooked, uh, re re reviewed. Yes, actually, it should be a side concern co compared to the main motivation, which is either because you want to be more involved or you might actually want one day to evolve towards more direct investment. But it shouldn't mean that you want only to save costs. You know, the Brits have, uh, have an expression which is uh, saving a penny, losing a pound. Yes. You should always be concerned about that in co-investment. Yes, because also if you're saying all these, uh, uh, the, the, the co-investment means you've got to be much more involved and worry about the risks. Um, you probably don't count that extra amount of effort that you need to put in of your own resources That's totally for governance true. and, yeah, uh, exactly. and, uh, yeah. uh, and the risks that you might take. Exactly. And, and also what you have to factor in is that if you're a co-investor, you have to actually share the transaction costs. Whereas in the fund, they're pooled over all the participants in the fund. Uh -huh. And this is something we tend to forget. So yeah, you save on the management fees and the carry interest, but you will have to pay also the transaction fees, the legal part and all these little elements which are a little bit hidden somewhere. Super. Well, thank you very much indeed. That was very enlightening and thank we you. look forward to reading the book. Thank you very thank much. You.